All Hello. right. Um, so this is our first NIM developer blog um, uh, uh, with uh, Arne During. Hi. And uh, myself. And I've prepared a few, well, bu bullet points that I would like to uh, uh, share with you. So, of course, we, we want to discuss here what we have done in the last months uh, regarding NIM development and our, uh, our future plans for, for NIM development. And um, it's n hardly structured, but it begins with uh, features that Arne has implemented. So um, now it's yeah. your turn, Arne. Okay. Hello. Yes. I'm Arne and um, yeah, I developed already a few uh, features and made a few changes in the NIM compiler. And so let's start with the first bullet point. Uh, I merged a lot of tests in the test suit into one big mega test. At least that's how I called it. The idea is that for well, the concept behind it is a lot of tests are executed uh, individually. The compiler compiles the main module, uh, the uh, system.nim, and then uh, runs the test. And it's done a few hundred times. And I think this is not really necessary. It really slows down the testing time ne uh, needed. and the online continuous integration servers constantly run out of time. They are get in a timeout and this slows down pull requests. And I wanted an improvement, something that scales better. So I made some analysis of tests. I tried to find out what what's really the requirement that tests can be joined automatically. And then I scanned through all test suits, did some refactoring to make this uh, change possible. And then I filtered out all tests that are capable to be joined in one test. This big test is one that basically just imports all the tests that can be joined in one test, compiles them in one compilation unit, and then executes them. So there's no special right. caching. And I just uh, executed this category for you. And so it, it says um, these, it, it joined almost uh, 460 tests together into one mega test <laughs> and uh, says, well, it's, it's green, right? The output is okay. And so these 460 tests would previously all cause a new compiler invocation, a new NIM compiler invocation and new C++ plus, uh, uh, C compiler invocations. And so this was a speed up of about, well, I don't know, this took roughly a, a minute to run. And previously it was, I think, about uh, 15 minutes, I think. So it, it was, it was uh, quite some, some nice speed up. Um, okay. okay. Next point is uh, size of and line of. No, no, wait. All, all tests are now run. It's. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Movement. I missed that. Yes. Or it's that basically it's a simple one. In the past, when you uh, created a new test in the tests folder, the tester would see this test as just compile it, but don't run it. And the default is changed now from compiling to running. A lot of tests were written without knowing that if they don't specifically say to execute the test, um, the test wouldn't be executed. So a lot of tests were basically in hibernation. They were just compiled, but never executed. And the default is changed. And we found a few bugs with that. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> quite some effort to, to change the default. Nice, it ni uh, was nice work, yes. Um, next one is also yours. 
Yes, that's that's probably the biggest uh, point of them all. It's uh, size of and line of at compile time. So basically, I have to re-implement the logic from the C compiler to know the offsets and sizes of all struct members and um, union members and so on. It's when when you look at it from um, from an easy example like like the one above, it seems easy. Just add up the sizes, and uh, that that's your result. But that's that's not easy. Depending on the compiler backend, things work differently. Depending on the platform, things work differently. Even even the operating system can mean that uh, pointers or integers or better said, integers are aligned differently. I think uh, it's mostly floating point. So on uh, uh, 32 bits x86 uh, machines, float takes eight bytes, but its alignment is still only required to be at, at four byte alignment. And that's for, for legacy reasons and um, yeah, and that's specific to the to the operating system and not to the to the um, CPU. Yeah, maybe I, we should mention what an alignment actually is. So when the um, when a new object is created, the object in in memory, the, the CPU is not optimized to read every byte address equally well. So for most primitive types for most uh, basic integer floating point types, a self alignment is optimal for the. I'm trying to for, draw a picture. Yeah, a self alignment is optimal for uh, the, the parser or not, not the parser. Oh, this is so the idea. So this is like, uh, yeah, for the CPU, uh, this is four bytes in memory. Okay. And, uh, you can you can have a, 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 a let's say call it a, a foolish prefix right some some other bytes before that some other byte before that and then um, this is not on a four byte boundary anymore and this is not liked by the by especially by older CPUs so. Um, what the machine wants you to do is to align it. Um, and so usually these are then zeros. Uh, let's see if I can somehow make this work. So that it's, you have these padding bytes inserted here, the zeros, so that this four integer byte, so this is the type int 32, is is aligned um yeah self-aligned <laughs> i i hope the image gets the point across. yeah mm. anyhow so the important thing is now that code that, that didn't you uh, uh, use that code that used to not compile now does compile so now you can ask what's the size of foo and nim the nim compiler now knows it too and doesn't have to delegate this work to the C compiler and then you can so you can store this information in a constant and have it available at compile time. Previously there were only few exceptions where for instance the, the compiler could al could always answer what's the size of an integer but for complex objects this was prohibited and now we uh, yeah now this feature is enabled. Okay. Um, um, so this is the next point we, uh, I, I, I merged a couple of pull requests, um, RE closer. So, um, um, changed our JavaScript code generator quite a bit. Um, so that now the more low level features of NIMP like PTR and address off have uh, much better support for the JavaScript code generator. And that's important because then this means that you can take much more 
NIM code that wasn't specifically written for JavaScript and compile it to JavaScript. Yeah, I think, I think you should explain the problem a bit. So what's the problem of um, a mapping a pointer to JavaScript? Why does a JavaScript reference not work? <laughs> uh, well, JavaScript doesn't have references. It has like uh, um, objects that, that have reference semantics or arrays with reference semantics. But um, in NIM you can do, and, and PTR is also, and, and also affects var, var t, so for example. Uh, let's say, let's pretend we don't have tuples as return values. And so what this P does is uh, it sets X to three and Y to seven. So, and now I can call and I can have variables um, A and B of type int, and then I can call P A B. And if I echo these, I would get, well, three and seven, obviously. Now, what the compiler internally does is it transforms it into a more low level representation, kind of like it's done in C. So these are actually pointers and this is pointer dereferencing. And we pass the address of these uh, variables to this P and um, this is not directly supported by JavaScript and um, so we need to do a more elaborate transformation so this is uh, this is done um, in the back end of, of the M compiler and then we need to find a way to translate these statements into JavaScript and what it's wh what it does i mean i don't really know javascript because i only generate this code but wh what's done here is that it has um it introduces uh helper parameters um uh no sorry doesn't do that it it does it it does this way it says okay X, I mean, it, it's, it's, we don't have the type info here, but what it does is, uh, because our arrays in JavaScript are mutable and have, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and enable this, this indirection. So what we then do is, um, this becomes, uh, <coughs> so let's say, so these are implicitly zero. So let's write it out. And in JavaScript, this is an array with one element and it's the zero and there's the zero in it. And then I call P with the, with A and B, but these are now arrays. And so they have, they can be mutated. And now um, the echo would be something like echo A, at position zero, B at position zero. Okay. So this is a really um, complex transformation. And now, of course, you can have this, this, this can nest, right? You can have pointers of pointers of pointers of int. And, uh, uh, one, one question that I still have is when you have an object yeah. with two members, like a, a bar of a tuple or it doesn't you really mean matter. Something like not in the parameter. Ah. The parameter is like it is, but the local variable is an object that has a member of an integer, and you pass the member. Um. The yeah, local... Then, then uh, so. Well, how to put it? Um, what you can. Uh, um, so first of all. You, you know JSON, right? So yeah. What, what do we have this in, in, in JavaScript internally? Yeah. Um, so 
and now you want to you, when I type object value this is the same as uh, object well I called it field so let's say field object field and um, <laughs> and um, oh, just a second. Christmas songs in the background. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Um, so these are these two things, and now what you can do uh, when you pass this this address of this thing around, um, you can tell. Look, this is my object, and this is. The, and that's why I, I lied a bit. So what it really does is there is an index here and an index there. Ah. Okay. And what it does okay. here for, for this is, is it's zero, the index. And now passing an object to this P uh, looks like and perhaps hmm yeah and, and my, my, so okay now I I have this question what do you do with sub members members of a member where a single field name isn't enough Yeah, but that's not that's not that doesn't that's not a problem because we have reference semantics all the way down so uh, ah, okay then you can just pass the okay the, the first param yeah. okay okay so yeah that that uh, I mean it worked well for for lo a long time but uh, Ari closer came along and said no no it's not working at all for me for my code and so he 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 basically he rewrote the logic to do that and I mean the test coverage is now is much better than before so I'm reasonably sure that uh, it's much better now I mean, obviously we had regressions, but the regressions have already been fixed too. And it seems pretty stable. And also I tested my, my Carax uh, J JavaScript code and it still works with the new improved JavaScript code generator. Okay, next change. We uh, eliminated nil for strings and sequences uh, from, from the NIM language. That was quite a bit ago already. Um, so now code that used to compile uh, doesn't anymore. And it's now uh, you need to write the empty string, which is much easier to work with because the empty string usually doesn't crash as often as nil does. And internally, we also changed the, the string representation a bit. So the empty string is now uh, mapped to nil. So this doesn't cause a, a memory allocation. So this string object. And this is um, just the beginning because uh, we also have a, an entirely new string uh, implementation in the works based on the destructor feature where any uh, kind of string literal will not cause an allocation. But it's, it's, it, uh, it was quite some work to implement this. And so this is the, the, this was the first step into this new, more efficient uh, world that NIM wants to, to get into. We um, also, um, um, have a new mode for the contiguous integration that um, says um, all the test cases should be compiled with uh, uh, NIM C++ compiler backend and um, that also <coughs> sh uh, uh, meant we had to, to fix a couple of C++ specific 
code generation bugs. Um, but it's, it, it works really well now. And the, the idea is that C++ uh, generates much better code for exception handling. And um, uh, I th um, you, you can actually feel this. Well, I can't demonstrate it here, but if I, well, let's see. So with the, um, well maybe I can demonstrate it, but I think it was only with Clang and I'm using GCC here. Um, so for me, usually, yeah, this is a bad example, but usually the bootstrapping time is about four seconds. And with the C++ code generator, for me, the bootstrapping time is 3.8 seconds. So uh, um, a, me a measurable speed up. Um, yeah, these are the big issues that are part of our version one plan so we want incremental compilation to work which means that the compiler only recompiles the modules that have been changed since the last compilation or the modules that dependent on modules that have been changed obviously and um, we do this with an um, by compiling the or by, by um, writing the ASTs uh, and type graphs, etc., into a database and um, loading them from a database. And this was also quite some work to implement, and it's still ongoing this work. But um, at least it works for for the compiler itself for bootstrapping. So uh, what needs to be done here is now that it. Um, that this caching aspect is not only uh, uh, related to the front end, but also that the C back end um, will cache the, the produced C code and just uh, emits the, the produced C code again when, when it detects that this whole module wasn't uh, changed at all since the, since the last compilation. Yeah, the next yeah. point is destructors. I've mentioned it briefly. We want to change uh, strings and sequences and them to use a different code generation strategy inspired by what C++ um, does. But also these, these destructors fe the feature should also be generally available for um, user-defined data types and for this uh, to work well we need new inno annotations to um, avoid the, the, the data copies that is uh, implied by uh, C++'s uh, value semantics so it's um, quite close to C++'s um, solution but we are innovated in uh, we innovated it slightly so that I'm sure in practice it will make a really big difference um, and we keep the high level nature of ordinary NIM code it's just clever tricks to to make your code run faster yeah uh, the, the idea is that in most cases these parameters can be inferred so that there's as little friction for the code that exists already and also for new code that has to be written because yeah. okay, it, it's just when you know that they are there they can be used for further optimizations um i'm right am i yeah so um Actually, I, I really like the sync parameter. So what, what it does is like um, the primary example is uh, usually it's called add and, uh, and not uh, push push to front or something like that. 
So let's say you have an, a container of T and you append some element. Um, what this means is this T is copied into the, the container C because usually the container already has some memory uh, <laughs> slots available for this T. And now in order to avoid this copy, we say, okay, this is a sync parameter. And so it, it declares that I, this, this C, uh, the, um, this ad takes ownership of this T and uh, afterwards the X should not be available. Now, um, and then we, we uh, go ahead and prove that this, that this works out. But the point is when you leave out the sync annotation, it still works, but it's slightly slower. And now the other, I, the, so this is the one aspect. So if you forget these new sync and lent annotations, nothing, nothing bad happens. Just the performance might be worse. So it's, it's just, there's nothing really dangerous going on here. And secondly, we can also infer these sinks and let annotations because NIMS uh, conventions are quite, uh, well, they are not enforced, but they are really uh, well followed by ordinary application code. And so we can say we have a, like a pattern that says every proc add uh, always has sync parameters here because that's the semantic of an ad is to embed something into a container. Or at least it should have a sync parameter. Oh, it should have. And, and even if we, again, if we get it wrong, then it's, then it's maybe a pessimization, but still not uh, something that can crash your code. Uh, okay. Do you think that was <laughs> understandable? I, I think so. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the next thing is, uh, is yours again. Yes, it's GDB support. Um, when I started NIM development, I saw that there was not a lot of um, debugger support for the language. I mean, I think you develop mostly or debug mostly with printf debugging or echo debugging. It works, but sometimes you just want to explore, step through a code, inspect some local variables. And it just didn't work as I wanted it to work. So I invested some time into GDB Python scripting. It, I, in, in the beginning, I, I didn't want to accept that I have to re-implement all two string methods uh, in Python again when they're already implemented in NIM. I just tried to call the NIM functions. And you can call from the debugger the NIM functions to print stuff. The problem is from the debugger, you normally just want to inspect code. Maybe you, sometimes you want to call a specific function, but most of the time you want you just want to inspect the code and calling a function manipulates the stack that you want to um, actually inspect. And this can actually cause some trouble, especially because some front ends want to visualize some objects that are not even initialized or point to some invalid memory locations causing all sorts of problems. And when the visualizer is run from the Python script, everything is fine. Python just says here it's invalid memory location. So the object isn't supposed to be visualized. Okay. And um, use, yeah, and to implement it, you have to use some, um, uh, Basically, you, you see the program as the NIM compiler emits the C code. So the closer the C code is to the NIM code, the easier it is to debug it. And um, sometimes the NIM compiler injects into the binary some uh, type information, for example, for uh, enums. There's somewhere this information this uh, the GDB knows how the identifier or I know how the identifier is supposed to be called and the Python script looks it up and checks whether this information is available and tries to always print 
as as much as it can. And it prints uh, sequences, it prints strings and enums and sets of enums. And yeah, basically that's it. I tried uh, to implement some uh, integration in uh, GDB front ends. I tried to uh, get it to work with some like Visual Studio Code has a front end for GDB. I tried it. I tried other front ends like um, for, for C++, there's Qt Creator. And everywhere, the debugger support was just broken, not implemented correctly, or the debugger was out of date, hasn't been, the front end hasn't been developed for several years. The API that I was using wasn't correct. <laughs> it <Yes>. just <laughs> didn't work. Those front ends are either just bad, horrible, I don't know. It just never worked. The only front end, interactive front end, where you could expand uh, local variables and see their value interactively, that actually worked was a bit surprising. It was Eclipse. Ah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I used Eclipse. Eclipse was actually helpful to develop the GDB support because Eclipse had useful error messages. It told me what I was doing wrong. It was using the API correctly and it told me where I was using it incorrectly. So I could then fix my code to make it work with Eclipse. But the problem is that you don't develop NIM with Eclipse. You have to create an, a fake project in Eclipse just to start the debugger. That's, that's not a great experience. But you can use GDB with it and it's actually quite cool. Um, yeah. And okay. I, 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 I personally just debug with the console or with the, the, the command line terminal interface or uh, with the integration of the terminal interface in Emacs, which is not much different than the terminal interface. It's just shown in Emacs. I see. Okay. And I tried to compile LLDB, so the debugger suit from, from LLVM. I tried to compile this piece of code on my Windows machine and failed. And that's... <laughs> That's why I left and said, okay, this is not any better than, than trying to compile GDB on my machine. And then I, I left it at that. Because if we had, uh, I mean, it's all open source, right? We you don't have to go and use their plugin API in Python if it doesn't really work out or if it's badly documented. You can also just patch GDB source code or LLDB source code to for better NIM interoperability. So that was my thought process, but uh, it's it's probably even more work than what you've been doing. And as I said, I couldn't even compile this because it depends on some strange. I don't know. Yeah, I have to mention that before developing the GDB uh, plugin in Python, I never wrote any Python code, so I also had to learn Python. Oh, interesting. Came to NIM without knowing Python first. Very interesting. Uh, okay. Um, the next point on our bullet list is here. Varty as a return type is now memory safe. So yeah, that's more like a, a, a nuance in the language. Um, so Varty as a return type, this is quite some old uh, feature. But it was all it um, it was it wasn't memory safe before. So let's see if I can uh, show you this quickly. Uh, let let me think. So this is usually the uh, the motivating example. Um, maybe. Okay, so this is a takes a float and returns a var int, and the question is, does does this? Uh, there were some measurements to prevent this, but now it works. Um, no, sorry. Um, so this is like a, a ref 
point ref type in C++. And so this is the, the classic bug, right? I returned a pointer to, to a local variable, to, to the stack frame that is just about to disappear, right? And um, so if I try to, to use this P afterwards, uh, then it was just it would just crash because it would dereference a pointer to something that's long gone. And so now this this is av is avoided at compile time uh, because what we say so so this this is correct this works so this is just forwarding so the the um, semantics are what's returned uh, is some view into a data. Um, into a data set that has already been passed into the proc. And the rule is that it's passed into the proc by in, by, um, via its, its first argument. So the first part, so if there are more here, like Y's and sets, then mm, the, the return value needs to derive from this, from the location that is from the first parameter here. And with this rule, we can then check this usage. And we here we see, even though we don't know the body of forward, we know that uh, what, what it returns is derived from, from this X here and not from anything else that might have been passed in here. Mm -hmm. And since we know X is, uh, is local, we can then here issue an, an, an error message and say. So, so it has to be the first parameter? Yes. Um, there is an extension where you can say like uh, this is derived and then it's off because I think it's, we called it off because off is already a keyword. So here in this declaration, you would claim that it's that you own this uh, by the Z parameter. Um, but that's not implemented. So this would be a further language extension if we if we think we need it, but it wasn't needed because no, in the okay. standard library, this is the only thing that happens. So okay, um, uh, but I I think of a use case. I don't have it in my code, but um, I really can imagine that there's a, a procedure that takes two var parameters some condition and depending on the condition it returns a reference to the first or the second um, yeah but that's c plus plus style that's just it doesn't work well in c plus plus it does work well with rust because it has a pretty decent borrowing checking um and the the nimish version of it is don't return refs return the value and then the problem also goes away so we we have a focus on value semantics just like c plus plus does Anyhow, so this is the um, so this is the primary motivation. So we have a table with key value pairs in it, and we have a view onto this key or, or, or this value, but it doesn't matter. So in both cases, uh, the the view is derived from something that is in T. Right, and T is always the first parameter, and that that's why it works out. And as I said, you can you can play games. You can say, okay, this is a var off, and then it's like, and then you can dream of of saying like this is a derived from different parameters. This this is just a different syntax for the the Rust idea then except that it's a bit nicer to work with in my opinion but it's uh, in my opinion it's unclear that we ever need this you will argue no 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 we need this because uh, depending on the uh, condition etc but i'm not yet convinced that we need it okay well i, I personally think that we might need to have that, that the var might come from any parameter. It should be limited to the first, but in general, I, I think it should come from, from parameters, from the parameter, from a var parameter. 
Um, yes, and it yeah. probably it it makes sense, but um, yeah, I mean, I I introduced this rule into Nim, and this var t is is used in the standard library, and nothing bro broke, right? Nothing. I mean, broke. yeah, it's the the standard library, but there are other um, uh, other projects and other types yes, of but programming. I, I, I mean, I got, I got, I think, one regression from somebody, and that's it. And all the yeah. other card, just, I mean, this is in the latest release, right? So people had a couple of months by now to figure out that the, that the, the, the rules for this VAT were nailed down. It doesn't. It didn't cost. And also, what you are think, what you are um, missing a bit is that the alternative, where you just say it, it's a pointer, is still valid, and then it's because pointer is unsafe anyway. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <coughs> In interesting concept. I. I... I still think we can support, but we can just add the support if it's needed. I mean, we don't need it right away. I mean, yeah, we have we have a good idea of how right. to generalize it. Yeah, so I don't think that we need it right now, but I think eventually we will support more. It, it doesn't need to be the first VAR parameter. Yeah, but as I said, I mean, yeah. it works. Yeah, I, I, I trust you, but I have ideas for libraries that would re need the var. To yeah, come I mean, from. I know the, the C++ talks where they are like, look at this. Uh, 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 and then it's this works because of the const ref extension, lifetime extension in C++. And then they write, then change the code slightly and do this instead and now the code breaks because b plus four is a is a is now a temporary no. that doesn't live link doesn't live yeah. long enough for this. Well, i think that the const um keeps the reference alive but if you remove the const then it breaks maybe the, yeah i think C++ but something like that yes yeah and great language yeah it's, it's <laughs> And and why? Because minimum has to to why why should minimum take two references returning the minimum reference? That's just, I mean I I know why, but it's just wrong. It's just wrong. Min minimum conceptually returns the minimum value. It doesn't return a view into the data just to save the copy, etc. It's just the yeah. wrong the wrong way to think about these things. It's, it's yeah. A, yeah. But no, I wasn't thinking about minimum. But yeah. Okay, let, let's move on. I think everything. Okay, so um, that's what we did. At least what we remember we did. I mean, obviously, there's all sorts of bug fixing and pull requests going on all the time and with lots of discussions about NIM features and how that should be done. Um, so, and the, what we want to do, it hasn't been flush, uh, uh, flushed out here as good as what we did do. Obviously, what we said in the VA8, V1 plan is still accurate. So we want destructors. We want incremental compilation. We want to fix the loophole for case objects. And we want to um, nail down the AST uh, specification so that it doesn't have to change anymore. And yeah, you, maybe you can ex, uh, explain a bit what I mean, what, what we mean with this comment field. Okay, yeah, the comment field is, well, in the current implementation, the AST has, an, is, is, yeah, it's a tree from nodes, and every node has a member saying comment. And this comment is part of every node in the compiler. Yeah, basically open the, the file. That's good. Uh, it's T node, I think. Yeah. yeah. There. And um, what's so annoying about this comment is the T node is a very compressed object. 
Yeah, it's it's final acyclic. It even has a common saying: it's thirty-two uh, thirty-two bits machine. This takes uh, thirty-two bytes. It's it's really optimized for size, and so that the size fits, the line info is very reduced. You can go to the implementation of T line info, and it really just uses as few bits possible to squeeze as for line information it has yeah. an integer for the file just not not a full integer for there were even people complaining that two two bytes for the line information is isn't enough there were files that needed more <laughs> especially generated files and um it and then there's in every node this common field that just wastes a lot of space, especially with the new string implementation. It would be the current string implementation is still based on pointers. So it's um, eight bytes. Yeah. But the new string implementation would need at least, I think, 16 bytes. Correct. So 16 bytes in every node just wasted for no gain. And, and these comments aren't even exposed in macros. So people can't do anything with it. I think the comment field is just um, a lazy implementation to to just support comments. Just put in there, not thinking about it, and save it up for later. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, it wasn't tacked into. It was uh, back then when the design was done. Uh, it wasn't clear how to attach comments to the AST, and people demanded that every comment could be just written everywhere like in other languages so there were no grammar enforcement rules that would guide you where to put your comments now this has been changed and now we have the diff a clear distinction between documentation comments and ordinary comments and ordinary comments are just thrown away but documentation comments remain in the AST for macros to to uh, to evaluate and um, so now this picture is, is a lot clearer than it used to be. And so this was just a, the, a, a general um, annotation. So every node could have could could be annotated with a comment. Um, but I, I agree that that it didn't work out well at all. But the the spec wasn't in the in the yeah, it just uh, wasn't clear enough. Yeah, I think in the in the code, because every node can have comments, uh, there's code that puts the comment just anywhere. And in the code that needs to process the comment doesn't know where it is. It can yep. be anywhere in, in the tree. So it actually searches through the tree to find the first comment. And that introduced a bug where the comment uh, came from some template expansion. <laughs> and, yes. And um, uh, that that's just a symptom of this this design, and yeah. there are also other problems. Yes, I mean, yeah, obviously, it <laughs> cost many bugs, and um... so now the idea is that um, documentation comments only make sense for symbols that also have the potential to be exported. So top level let uh, top level constants top level procedures they all can be uh, documented and they are allowed to have a comment and since code that processes these symbols or identifiers already need to take into consideration the postfix operator the star operator it makes sense to just extend this postfix operator with a documentation comment and just say hey, this is not really a postfix operator anymore, yeah. but it is um, the thing that contains the uh, declaration that it is exported and it contains the comment as, as just a yeah, let comment me, let field. Me fill this out for you. So this is the syntax, so usually written like that, maybe with a quality, but let's focus on this and so what what what's currently done is this is an nk proc dev uh, with a name and then a, the, the name is uh, it's a post fix so actually 
depending on whether you uh, use the macro system or the compiler. So in the macro system, it's NNK, and in the compiler, it's just NK. Okay, um, so it would be like, this is a postfix operator of P with a star, and uh, this means P is exported. I would like to mention at this point that NIM doesn't really have a postfix operator. The postfix operator is only used to mark procedures as exported, nothing else. Well, yes, to mark uh, symbols in general as exported, yes. Um, and the doc comment is not really to be found in the IST at this, in this step. So what we do instead, we say, okay, this is, mm, so this is the, the uh, old NIM is this, new NIM, upcoming version, turns this into, um, you called it, what, what did you call it? Um, how, how did I call it? Export doc. Uh, export doc, yes. So with the P and then there is the star, if there is one, and with this, the third, no, the third. It's just the comment, just the yeah, without the double hash, it's just the string. Okay, so this way. And so now this is, that's the only node that supports a comment field. This, so that's the export doc. So it, it merges these two concepts. Either it, uh, I mean, this can also be empty. So that then it would be uh, an empty node. Well, well, well it's, yes. And, and, and the doc comment is still um, a doc comment. It's a node of NIM NNK doc statement. Um, I think it's comment statement. Yeah, comment statement. Yeah, okay, good point. Yes, so the, the comment statement has line information and can point to exactly the position where that comment was written. Yeah. So that, that's not lost. Um, yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's it. Basically, where you had to um, take into consideration the postfix. Now you also need to, to adopt the export doc. The postfix, you can drop it if you don't care about old compilers. Um, if you care, you just have to, for the transition phase, you have to uh, handle both cases. So it, it is a breaking change, but it, it's one where... Yeah, and so this, this, is, this is like, uh... In the in the tests in the NIM tests, this <coughs> is used five times. Oh. So that's the idea. It's really a minor breaking change because this node is just uh, rarely used at all. And if it's used, you need to um, change the the code well, a bit. Well, if you generate the NIM node post fix, I think it still works. I didn't throw anything out there. Um, um, yeah. But um, when you just the parser doesn't create it anymore yeah so it's just here where where, where this case needs to be added so no, I, I i'm on it i was running the test cases and this test is not one that i needed to adopt it, it still works okay fair enough but so it was really uh, yeah it's just a, a minor thing that uh, will um, yeah will we'll improve the situation now the the I, after this change the AST is in 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 a well shape and we can uh, write down its specification and say this is the AST specification it won't change anymore it's stable right um, yes generally I mean. I, I would wait. I would just let people try it out and uh, say, now you have time to complain. And if they don't, then then it's stable. If I, I Fair don't enough. trust. <laughs> Fair <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, what we have been working on and that we want to work on. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Status for its tremendous support. Uh, allowing us to to work on this uh, on these things, and um, so that's the our first developer block. 
Any... Uh, thank you that you are still listening and um, hope to see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye.